Bill introduced um, Isaiah. We're going to look at the second part of, of the book. Um, just a couple of things in review. One is um, Isaiah is the kind of coined as the Mount Everest of the Old Testament prophecy. And in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, Isaiah, Isaiah says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And also in chapter 53, verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Two of the main passages um, for, this, for this book. Brother Bill kind of reviewed last week the survey, some parts of the survey, the prophecies of comfort, the gospel according to Isaiah, the prophecies of condemnation, and then a couple of keys which we just read, and the key word for the book being salvation. So let's take a look at the part one and two videos, and then we'll get into the, the second part of this study, dealing with some of the prophecies and five main keys. The book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah lived in Jerusalem in the latter half of Israel's kingdom period, and he spoke on God's behalf to the leaders of Jerusalem and Judah. He spoke, first of all, a message of God's judgment. He warned Israel's corrupt leaders that their rebellion against their covenant with God would come at a cost, that God was going to use the great empires of Assyria and after them Babylon to judge Jerusalem if they persisted in idolatry and oppression of the poor. But that announcement was combined with a message of hope. Isaiah believed deeply that God would one day fulfill all of his covenant promises, that he would send a king from David's line to establish God's kingdom, remember 2 Samuel 7, that he would lead Israel in obedience to all the laws of the covenant made at Mount Sinai, remember Exodus chapter 19. And all of this was so that God's blessing and salvation would flow outward to all of the nations, like God promised to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And it's this hope that compares compelled Isaiah to speak out against the corruption and idolatry of Israel in his day. Now, the book has a pretty complex literary design, but there's one simple way to see how it all fits together. Chapters 1 through 39 contain three large sections that develop Isaiah's warning of judgment on Israel. And it all culminates in an event pointed to at the end of chapter 39, the fall of Jerusalem and the exile of the people to Babylon. But in chapters 1 to 39, there's also a message of hope that after the exile, God's covenant promises would all be fulfilled. And chapters 40 to 66 pick up that promise of hope and develops it further. In this video, we're just going to focus on chapters 1 to 39. The first main section focuses on Isaiah's vision of judgment and hope for Jerusalem, and it begins as Isaiah accuses the city's leaders of covenant rebellion, idolatry, injustice, and God says he's going to judge the city by sending the nations to conquer Israel. Isaiah says that this will be like a purifying fire that burns away all that's worthless in Israel in order to create a new Jerusalem that's populated by a remnant that has repented and turned back to God, and Isaiah says that that's when God's kingdom kingdom will come and all nations will come to the temple in Jerusalem and learn of God's justice, bringing about an age of universal peace and harmony. Now, it's this basic storyline of the old Jerusalem purifying judgment into the new Jerusalem. This is going to get repeated over and over throughout the book, getting filled in with increasing detail. So, at the center of this section is Isaiah's grand vision of God sitting on his throne in the temple. And he's surrounded by these heavenly creatures that are shouting that God is holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah suddenly realizes just how corrupt he and his people Israel are. And he's certain that he's going to be destroyed by God's holiness, but he's not. 
God's holiness in the form of this burning coal comes and burns him, but not to destroy. Rather, it purifies him from his sin. And as Isaiah ponders the strange experience, God commissions him with a very difficult task. He is to keep announcing this coming judgment, but because Israel has reached a point of no return, his warnings are going to have a paradoxical effect of hardening the people. But Isaiah is to trust God's plan. Israel is going to be chopped down like a tree and left like a stump in a field. And that stump will itself be scorched and burned. But after all of that burning, God says that this smoldering stump is a holy seed that will survive into the future. It's a small sign of hope, but who or what is that holy seed? The rest of this section offers an answer. Isaiah confronts Ahaz, a descendant of David and a king of Jerusalem, and he announces his downfall. God says that it's the great empire of Assyria who will first chop Israel down and devastate the land, but there's hope. Because of God's promise to David, he's going to send after this destruction a new king named Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Emmanuel's kingdom is going to set God's people free from violent, oppressive empires. And Isaiah describes this coming king as a small shoe of new growth that will emerge from the old stump of David's family. It's this king that's the holy seed from chapter 6. And the king is going to be empowered by God's spirit to rule over a new Jerusalem and bring justice for the poor, and all nations will look to this messianic king for guidance. His kingdom will transform all creation, bringing peace. Now, you finish chapters 1 through 12 with a pretty good understanding of Isaiah's message of judgment and hope. But when will this all happen? Isaiah saw another empire arising after Assyria, and that's Babylon, who would also attack Jerusalem and actually succeed in destroying it. And that brings us into the next sections of the book. So first, we have a large collection of poems that explore God's judgment and hope for the nations. We learn, first of all, of the fall of Babylon and Israel's neighbors. Isaiah could see that Assyria's world power would one day be replaced by the empire of Babylon, a nation even more destructive and arrogant. And Babylon's kings claimed that they were higher than all other gods, and so God vows to bring Babylon down. And not only Babylon. Isaiah goes on to list Israel's neighbors, accusing them all of the same kind of pride and injustice, and he predicts their ultimate ruin. But remember, for Isaiah, God's judgment is never the final word for Israel or the nations. And that leads into the next section with a series of poems that tell a tale of two cities. There's the lofty city that has exalted itself above God and become corrupt and unjust. This city is an archetype of rebellious humanity and it's described with language that's all borrowed from Isaiah's earlier descriptions of Jerusalem and Assyria and Babylon all put together. This city is destined for ruin and one day is going to be replaced by the New Jerusalem, where God reigns as king over a redeemed humanity from all nations, and there's no more death or suffering. These chapters are the climax to this section, and it shows how Isaiah's message pointed far beyond his own day. It was a message for all who are waiting for God to bring his justice on violent, oppressive kingdoms and bring his kingdom of justice and peace and healing love. The following section returns the focus to the rise and fall of Jerusalem. And first we find a whole bunch of poems where Isaiah accuses Jerusalem's leaders for turning to Egypt for military protection against Assyria. He knows this will backfire. And Isaiah says that only trust in their God and repentance can save Israel now. Which gets illustrated by the following story about the rise of Hezekiah, king of Jerusalem. Just as Isaiah predicted, the Assyrian armies come and try to attack the city. And so Hezekiah humbles himself before God and he prays for divine deliverance, and the city is miraculously saved overnight. But Hezekiah's rise is immediately followed by his fall. So he hosts a delegation from Babylon, and he tries to impress them by showing everything in Jerusalem's treasury and temple and palaces. It's clearly an effort to make another political alliance for protection. Isaiah hears about this, and he confronts Hezekiah for his foolishness. He predicts that this ally will one day betray him and return as an enemy to conquer Jerusalem. And we know from 2 Kings chapters 24 and 25 that Isaiah was right. Over a hundred years later, Babylon would turn on Jerusalem, come and destroy the city, its temple, and carry the Israelites away to exile in Babylon. 
And so all of Isaiah's warnings of divine judgment in chapters 1 to 39 lead up to this moment. He's shown to be a true prophet because it all came to pass like he said. But remember, the purpose of God's judgment was to purify Jerusalem and bring the holy seed and messianic kingdom over all nations. And it's that hope that gets explored in the next part of the book. But for now, that's what Isaiah chapters 1 to 39 are all about. The book of the prophet Isaiah. In the first video, we explored chapters 1 to 39, which was Isaiah's message of judgment and hope for Jerusalem. He accused Israel's leaders of rebellion against God and said that through Assyria and then Babylon, Israel's kingdom would come crashing down in an act of God's judgment. And so chapter 39 concluded with Isaiah predicting Jerusalem's fall to Babylon in the exile. And a hundred years after Isaiah, it all sadly came to pass. But Isaiah's greater hope was for a new purified Jerusalem where God's kingdom would be restored through the future messianic king and all nations would come together in peace. And so chapters 40 and following explore this great hope. The first main section, chapters 40 to 48, open with an announcement of hope and comfort for Israel. The people are told that the Babylonian exile is over and that Israel's sin has been dealt with, a new era is beginning. So they should all return home to Jerusalem where God himself will bring his kingdom and all nations will see his glory. Now, let's stop for a moment because this opening announcement raises a big question, that is, who is saying all of this? Whose voice are we hearing in these words of hope? The perspective of the prophet in these chapters is that of somebody who's living after the exile, in other words, in the time period described by Ezra and Nehemiah. But Isaiah died 150 years before any of that. So what are we supposed to make of this? Well, there are many who think that it's still Isaiah in his own day speaking, but that he's been prophetically transported, so to speak, 200 years into the future, and that he's speaking to future generations generations as if the exile is past. However, the book of Isaiah itself gives us some clues that something else is probably going on. In chapters 8 and 29 and 30, we're told that after Isaiah was rejected by Israel's leaders, that he wrote and sealed up in a scroll all of his messages of judgment and hope, and that he passed it on to his disciples as a witness for days to come. Eventually, Isaiah died, waiting for God to vindicate his words. Now remember, chapters 1 to 39 were designed to show us that Isaiah's predictions of judgment were fulfilled in the exile. He's a true prophet. And so after exile is over, Isaiah's disciples, who have treasured his words for so long, open up the scroll and begin applying his words of hope to their own day. So on this view, the book of Isaiah consists of that first collection of Isaiah's words as well as the writings of his prophetic disciples that God uses to extend Isaiah's message of hope to future generations. Whichever view you end up taking, everybody agrees that these chapters are announcing that the future hope has come, that God is fulfilling Isaiah's prophetic promises. And so the prophet hopes that Israel will respond by becoming God's servant. That is, after experiencing God's justice and mercy through history, that they will now begin to share with the nations who God truly is. But that's not what's happening. Israel, instead of bearing witness to the nations, is actually complaining and even accusing God. They say, the Lord doesn't pay attention to our trouble. In fact, he's ignoring our cause. The Babylonian exile, understandably, caused Israel to lose faith in their God. I mean, maybe he's not that powerful. Maybe the gods of Babylon are way greater than our God. And so the rest of these chapters, 41 to 47, are set up like a trial scene. God is responding to these doubts and accusations with the following arguments. He says first that the exile to Babylon was not divine neglect. Rather, it was divinely orchestrated as a judgment for Israel's sin. And second, it was for Israel's sake that God raised up Persia to conquer Babylon so they could come back home fulfilling Isaiah's words. So the right conclusion that Israel should draw is that their God is the king of history, not the idols of the nations. In the fall of Babylon and the rise of the Persian king Cyrus, Israel should see God's hand at work and so become his servant, telling the nations who he is. But by the end of the trial, chapter 48, we find that Israel is still as rebellious and hard-hearted as their ancestors. And so God disqualifies them as his servant, but God still is on a mission to bless the nations. And so the prophet says God's going to do a new thing to solve this problem. 
which moves into the next section, 49 to 55. We're introduced to a figure who's called God's servant, who's going to fulfill God's mission and do what Israel has failed to do. God gives this servant the title Israel and sends this person on a mission to, first of all, restore the people of Israel back to their God, but second, to become God's light to the nations. And we're told that this servant is empowered by God's spirit to announce good news and to bring God's kingdom over all of the nations. It sounds just like the Messianic king from chapters 9 and 11. But then we learn the surprising way of how the servant will bring God's kingdom. He's going to be rejected and beaten and ultimately killed by his own people. In reality, as he's being accused and sentenced to death, he's dying on behalf of the sin of his own people. The prophet says the servant's death is a sacrifice of atonement for the people's evil and rebellion. And then, after his death, all of a sudden, the servant is just alive again. And we hear that by his death, he provided a way to make people righteous. That is, to put them in a right relationship with God. And so this section concludes by describing two ways people can respond to the servant. Some will respond with humility and turn from their sins and accept what God's servant did on their behalf. These people are called the servants, and also the seed. Remember the holy seed from chapter 6. These are the ones who will experience the blessing of the messianic kingdom. But there are others who are called simply the wicked, and they reject both the servant and his servants, which brings us to the final section of the book, 56 to 66, where the servants inherit God's kingdom. These chapters are beautifully designed as a symmetry that brings together all of the themes of the book. At the very center are three beautiful poems that describe how the spirit-empowered servant is announcing the good news of God's kingdom to the poor. And he reaffirms all of the promises of hope from earlier in the book. The new Jerusalem, inhabited by God's servants, will be the place from which God's justice and mercy and blessing flow out to all the nations of the world. And surrounding these poems are two long prayers of repentance, where the servants confess Israel's sin and they grieve over all of the evil they see in the world around them. And so they ask God to forgive them and that his kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. Now on each side of these prayers are collections of more poems that contrast the destiny of the servants with that of the wicked who persecute them. God says he's going to bring his justice on all who pollute his good world with their evil and selfishness and idolatry and that he's going to remove them from his city forever. But the servants, those who are humble before God and who repent and own their evil, they are forgiven and they will inherit the new Jerusalem, which we discover is an image for an entirely renewed creation where death and suffering are gone forever. And this brings us to the very outer frame of this part of the book. In this renewed world of God's kingdom, people from all nations are invited to come and join the servants of God's covenant family so that everyone can know their creator and redeemer. And so the book of Isaiah ends with the very grand vision of the fulfillment of all of God's covenant promises. Through the suffering servant king, God creates a covenant family of all nations who are awaiting the hope of God's justice and bringing a renewed creation, where God's kingdom finally comes here on earth as it is in heaven. And that's the very powerful hope of the book of Isaiah. All right, so let's look at the last half of this study. Seeing Jesus in Isaiah. When he speaks about Christ, Isaiah sounds more like a New Testament writer than he does an Old Testament prophet. His messianic prophecies are clear and more explicit than any of other, the other books of the Old Testament. They describe many aspects of the person and work of Christ in his first and second advents and often blend the two together. So here are uh, a few of the prophecies that we see in the book of Isaiah and their fulfillment. And I'm, I'm going to read the prophecy and then we'll just uh, note the fulfillment of those prophecies in the New Testament. So the first one is uh, Isaiah 7, uh, chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And that's fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. 
The second one is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. And later time, he has made glorious the way of the sea and the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them, or on them has light shone. And that prophecy was fulfilled um, in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. The next one is Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This was fulfilled in um, Luke chapter 2, verse 11, and then also in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. The next prophecy is Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. This is fulfilled in several passages, Luke chapter 3, verses 23 and 32, and Acts chapter 13. The next prophecy is Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counseling and might, the spirit of knowledge and in fear of the Lord. We see this fulfilled in Luke chapter 3, verses, or verse 22. Another prophecy, Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, of a future foundation, whoever believes will not be in haste. And that is fulfilled in 1 Peter chapter 2. The next one is Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. <clears throat> a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough place a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. We see this fulfilled in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. The next one is Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 4. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit on him and will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the, co and the coastlands wait for his law. The fulfillment of this is in Matthew chapter 12, verses 15 to 21. In Isaiah 42, chapter 6, 42, verse 6, we see, I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and, to, and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. And this is fulfilled in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 29. In Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. This is fulfilled in Matthew chapter 26, chapter 27 verse 26 and verse 30. Another one is in Matthew, uh, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 14. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of children of mankind. We see this fulfilled in Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. In Isaiah chapter 53, 
verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. This was fulfilled in Luke chapter 23, in John 111, and John 7, 5. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him that was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. We see the fulfillment of this in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before his shears is silent, he opened not his mouth. This is fulfilled in Matthew chapter 27, verses 12 to 14, and John chapter 1, verse 29, and 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Isaiah 53, 9. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. We see this fulfilled in Matthew chapter 27, verses 57 to 60. Isaiah 53, 12. There I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of, sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. We see this fulfilled in Mark chapter 15, verse 28. And the last one, Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. This was fulfilled in Luke chapter 4, verses 17 to 19, and also in verse 21. Just a sampling. The Old Testament has over 300 prophecies about the first advent of Christ, and Isaiah contributes a number of them the odds that even 10 of them would be fulfilled. Now, we just looked at 17 of these in the book of Isaiah. The odds that even 10 of them could be fulfilled by one person is a, is a statistical marvel. Isaiah's messianic prophecy that await fulfillment in the Lord's second advent include several. One grouping of these is prophecies that await fulfillment in the second coming of Jesus Christ. We see this in a couple of different passages. Um, I'll read a few of these. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2. In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. In uh, chapter 11, verse 10, I'll skip that one. We'll go to chapter 11, verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. In chapter 49, and verse 7, thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Amazing. Ama chapter 52, verse 15. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which is not been told to them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Um, Isaiah chapter 60, verse, verses 1 through 3. 
Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the prophecies. But the Lord shall arise upon you, and his glory shall be, shall be seen upon you. And the nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. And th- this, the central passage, Isaiah chapter 52, um, beginning at verse 13 and going all the way to chapter 53, verse 12, present five different aspects of the saving work of Christ. And I'm going to skip over and we'll, we'll hit those five aspects one by one. So Isaiah chapter 52, verses 13 through 15. This speaks of his wholehearted sacrifice. So this is the first of five in burnt offerings. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. The second one is in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 5, and this is his perfect character. So the first one, his wholehearted sacrifice. The second one, this one deals with his perfect character. Who has believed what he has heard from us. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground, had no form or majesty that we should look upon him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. The third one, he brought atonement that issues in peace with God. And we see this in chapter 53, verses 4 through 6. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He brought this atonement that issues peace with God. The fourth one, he paid for the transgression of the people. This would be their sin offering. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 through 9. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a sheep that is led before the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. The fifth one, he died for the effects of sin. And these, all of these are fleshed out in the New Testament with detail. But the clarity with which Isaiah spoke of them or this book speaks of them is, is remarkable. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, he died for the effects of sin. Yet it was the will of, God, of the Lord to crush him he, was put, he put him to grief, and his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. The clarity that Isaiah sees the coming Christ, the coming Messiah, and the responsibility and the duties and the things that will be accomplished by that Messiah. Verse 12, therefore I will divide him a portion with the many and he shall divide the spoil with the strong 
because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah's contribution to, to the Bible. Isaiah is quoted in the New Testament far more than any other prophet. He is mentioned 21 times by name, and chapter 53 alone is quoted or alluded to at least 85 times in the New Testament. Isaiah is characterized by systematic presentation, brilliant imagery, broad scope, clarity, beauty, and power. Some of his prophecies have been fulfilled, but many await fulfillment. Our Lord, for example, quoted Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 2, and in Luke 4, verses 18 through 20, but stopped mid-sentence to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Also in the day of vengeance of our God, the first part was indeed fulfilled by God, but the second awaits fulfillment when he comes again, not as a suffering servant, but as a ruling king. Just a small sampling of the, the second part of this book that gives us so many prophecies fulfilled. And, it, and in addition to all of the prophecies fulfilled, the prophecies that await fulfillment in the second coming. And then in addition to that, the five different aspects of the saving work of Christ that we just looked at. A long book to read, but an amazing, an amazing foreshadowing and forecasting of what is to come by the Messiah. Next week, we will be looking at Jeremiah. And I hope that you're having a little bit of time to kind of read through some of the passages of these books before we, uh, before we get to studying them. And um, I believe all of these videos are uh, on YouTube. And so you can just Google those and take a look at any of these that you'd like that we've already covered or ones that we're, we're headed toward. Um, I believe one of our Sunday school teachers in introduction to one of the books that we were studying used one of these videos uh, in the New Testament just to kind of give an idea of what, what does this book look like? What's the, the overview of the book before they began studying it? So just another way to use that resource. Well, we thank the Lord for this amazing prophetic book. I thank you guys for being here. Continue to pray for, for Brother Bill and, um, and their time away, the folks that are um, rebuilding um, for Faye and for Brother Charlie. Some of the others that we mentioned this morning. Let's pray.